Thank you for joining the Weave online user group. Today, we have a guest speaker, Patrick Shanison from Docker. Let's test to see if he can turn his video and microphone on. Great, here you are. Um, hopefully people can hear me as well. This is the title for um, Patrick Shanison's talk, which is Docker for Devs and Ops, what's new and what's next. So um, as you probably know, just a couple weeks ago, there was DockerCon. So we're fresh off the heels of DockerCon, where Patrick was doing a lot of work. Um, and we'll all be able to share some of the updates from that event. <clears throat> and then um, also, hopefully, you can see the next slide. Advances, yes. Um, and also, hopefully, a lot of you already know Luke Marsden from WeWorks, who's presented many times. And um, he will be talking about sort of the latest updates that uh, he and um, Justin Cormack at Docker worked on to make sure that Prometheus and Docker Swarm have a smooth integration for any of you who are interested in using monitoring with Prometheus with Docker Swarm. All right, so let's talk about Docker for devs and ops. So hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Patrick Chanazon. I'm at Docker. Um, and today, I'm going to try to give you a, a recap of uh, all the announcements, or, or many of the announcements that we made at DockerCon. Um, so let's start with uh, what Docker is and what, what the company is doing. Our, our goal is to build tools of mass innovation. And what we mean by that in the short term is uh, building a programmable internet. And what we mean by that is there are lots of different devices that are getting connected to the internet. And one of the big unlocker of creativity would be to allow developers to program all these devices, but using uh, the same tools, as opposed to lots of different silos for whether you're programming for IoT or for cloud or for cars, all the different devices. So in order to achieve that, uh, we're building that stack to program the internet uh, that starts at the bottom with standards. Uh, so this is the OCI standard for image and runtime for containers. On top of that, we have infrastructure, a lot of components that people can use separately. And then on top of that, we build a development platform and a commercial product. What that translates to is uh, at the standards level, there's OCI. Uh, so it's a Linux Foundation collaborative project where 40 of uh, the companies working on containers converge to create standards. Uh, and the standard for runtime and image uh, is, has been in the works for nearly two years, and it's nearing a 1.0 pretty soon. Uh, on top of that, uh, there's infrastructure plumbing. Uh, and there, I'm going to tell you about the Mobi project and all the different kits that we have extracted out of the Docker code base. And you can build your own container system uh, based on that. On top of that, there's Docker CE, Docker Community Edition. So that's a developer platform uh, that's uh, built based on the open source. And that's a product. It's a free product by Docker. And then on top of that, we build Docker Enterprise Edition, which is our commercial product uh, targeting enterprises. So let's talk about Docker for developers. Uh, at Docker, we think the best tools get out of the way, adapt to you, uh, and make the simple powerful. Uh, make the powerful simple. Uh, so that's, that's what you get when you're using Docker tools. Uh, we try to, to build our, our tools so that you can use them uh, with the existing stuff that you're having. They adapt to you. They get out of the way. They should be very seamless, uh, adapting them to your existing workflow, uh, debugging processes, uh, your CI CD systems, and your deployment uh, uh, platforms. And making the powerful simple, now running anything that has been containerized is just one command line away. So in order to make that happen, we build uh, these editions, community editions, or enterprise editions running on different platforms. So people can run Docker on their Mac or on Windows, uh, but they can also run that on Azure, Amazon, uh, or Google Cloud. So we're trying to build better tools for developers. And what that means is removing friction in the development cycle. Uh, and 
the the way we're we're doing that, uh, so we have a, a very secret process for that. Three easy steps. Uh, the first step is uh, a developer complains about the detail. Uh, second step, we listen to developers and they send issues or GitHub or, or either GitHub issues or they ping us on Twitter. Uh, and we listen to all these, we fix the detail, uh, and then we just iterate on that. And so in the developer experience, if you're looking at our GitHub uh, repo, uh, you'll find lots of closed issues uh, in the past few months. Uh, we're just going to talk about two that we talked at DockerCon. Uh, the first one is uh, my container images are too big. Uh, so pretty often, um, uh, pretty often, developers uh, are are bringing everything in the kitchen sink into their Docker image in order to be able to build their application. So, for example, if you're building a Java application, you will have the GDK in there, uh, as well as maybe Maven uh, and some other components that you're using to build it. Uh, but then you don't want to have that in the final image. So people have been working around that by uh, creating multi-stage builds with shell scripts and other tooling or make files. Uh, now we're into, at DockerCon, we introduce multi-stage builds, uh, which allows you to uh, avoid that and have a first stage of your build uh, process that uses a Docker image that's pretty, uh, pretty heavy, that has all your build environment. And then that stage creates an artifact that you that you copy into a very minimal runtime image, uh, and you just copy the artifact, and so this one will be much smaller. So the way it works is that when you're looking at your Docker file, uh, traditionally in a Docker file you would have a from uh, directive, and then you would have a bunch of steps, uh, but you could have only one from directive in your Docker file. Uh, in multi-stage build, now you can have as many from statements uh, in your Docker file as you want. Uh, and you can create artifacts in one of the stages and then copy these artifacts into the next stage. So here you see an example where you have a, a, build, a, a, big, um, a big image that has all my build dependencies. Then I have a bunch of steps where I'm going to compile my code and create one artifact. And in the second image here from tiny run base, so here, for example, if you're doing a Java application, it could just be from Java. Uh, uh, if you're having a Go application, you can do from scratch. You just need to copy the binary uh, in there. And there you can copy, and this is the new instructions dash dash from, where you can reference the, um, uh, the index of the, of the from layer uh, of the from step uh, that you have created above. So here I'm copying from zero in slash artifact. I'm going to copy what's in artifact into slash run slash app. So I just copy what I need from the build image. So multi-stage build uh, will help you uh, create smaller images and lots of uh, developers have been asking for that. The second example is uh, you're a developer, you're creating your application, uh, but then you wish it was easier to take that app from your desktop to the cloud, uh, either for testing or for collaborating with other people or for staging uh, or sometimes from product, for, for, for production. And so for that, we introduced a new feature called Desktop to Cloud. Uh, and Desktop to Cloud looks something like that where in Docker desktop editions, uh, Mac and Windows, you have a menu with a whale. And there in that menu, you have some new, um, uh, new menu items, uh, which are your, your sign-in. So you can sign in to your Docker ID uh, into Docker Cloud. And in Docker Cloud, you can provision swarms. And once you have provisioned them there, uh, you can give them access to your colleagues based on their Docker IDs. And once you gave them access, they would see, and you will see, this new swarm menu while you have the list of swarms that you have access to. And these swarms can run into Docker for AWS or Docker for Amazon. Uh, and you don't need to trade SSH keys with your colleagues that you want to give access to a swarm. You just go to uh, Docker Cloud, you give them access to it, uh, and then they can start using that right away. 
Uh, and here, when I go to swarms and I click on one of the swarms, uh, I will be, uh, there's a terminal window that opens and that has the tunnel to the right swarm. And so all the access control uh, is taken care of for me. So that's what it looks like in Docker Cloud. Uh, you can create a swarm. Uh, today, I think you can create it on Amazon. Uh, the Azure driver is coming soon, and then the, the Google Cloud Platform driver is coming next. Uh, so here you can see the different um, swarms that I have on the left. And then on the right, there's all the teams that I can give access to my swarms. So this is available in the Docker Edge releases. Uh, a few months ago, we announced um, a new release uh, schedule for Docker. So we have Docker Community Edition and Docker Enterprise Edition. Both ship every three months. Uh, but for the Community Edition, there's an Edge release uh, that you can get when you go on Docker Store uh, to get Docker. Uh, you, you can choose Edge release. When you get that, uh, this one gets every month, and you can get some newer features in there. And so if you're running an edge release um, of Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, you can get access to that functionality today. OK, so let's talk about Docker for Apps. Um, what, um, oops. OK. Yeah, so uh, what we talked about at DockerCon was um, uh, that the need uh, for apps is to go to production, and going to production uh, is hard. Uh, but going to production securely is extremely hard. And so the challenges of production systems are that they are distributed systems. And so people can think that distributed systems are just small systems. We can use the same tools. Uh, but actually, the real solution is to use secure orchestration. And so talking about secure orchestration, this is what uh, uh, a container stack looks like with infrastructure management at the bottom, operating system on top, container runtime, and orchestration on top, and then application services. Uh, in the Docker case, this is what we call Swarm Kit with Swarm Mode. It has a bunch of components, and all these components play together in order to provide a secure experience. And so Diogo Monica for, from the security team explain how these different features and components play together to provide a complete secure orchestration uh, experience. And so it starts with secure node introduction. Every node in a Docker Swarm has their own cryptographic identity. Uh, so the, uh, and the cryptographic identity is, tar is tied to the swarm ID, the node ID, and the node role, whether it's a manager uh, or a worker. Uh, then with that cryptographic identity, we can start doing uh, mutual TLS between all the nodes. So that means that all the communication between all the nodes are encrypted and the certification are rotated. Uh, then we have labels that allow us to do cluster segmentation. I can schedule some containers just on the host uh, that have specific security characteristics. And then on top of that, we can build uh, encrypted networks. So a Docker has built-in networking. Um, in your Compose file, when you deploy a, a service with Docker Stack Create, uh, you can specify that you want a network between the containers to be encrypted, and it will be done automatically for you. It's just uh, adding uh, um, in your YAML, in your Compose file, encrypted uh, equals true uh, parameter. And then on top of that, once you have all that uh, cryptographic node identity, mutual TLS, uh, encrypted network, and automatic certificate rotation, then with all that and the RAF store that we have, uh, that allowed us to build a really secure secret distribution where there's a new feature in Docker that lets you create secrets. Uh, your application will have access to these secrets. Your container can have access to these secrets in uh, tempfs. Uh, and only the containers that you specify that need to have access to that secret will have access to it. And these secrets are stored encrypted in the Swarm RAF store. Uh, so this is a pretty unique uh, secure orchestration feature that doesn't exist into uh, any other um, container orchestration systems. Uh, 
or at least it doesn't exist in such a secure way. Very often, they either store uh, secrets on the file system, or they pass them in environment variables, or they have a, a store for the secrets that's not encrypted. Uh, so, so that was Docker for Ops. So Docker for devs, making life easier for developers, making them more productive uh, with multi-stage build and uh, uh, desktop to cloud. On the upside, uh, it was mostly about um, uh, secure orchestration. Uh, and then let's talk about uh, uh, Mobi. So when you have a container platform, it's built out of all these layers that I talked to you about. Uh, and in the, uh, in the Docker case, uh, we have components for each of these layers. So we have InfraKit at the bottom to manage infrastructure, Linux Kit on top uh, that we announced at DockerCon. I'm going to tell you about that. That's our, our toolkit to build uh, secure, lean, uh, and portable uh, Linux subsystems. On top of that, we have ContainerD, which is the core container runtime of Docker that has been donated to CNCF back in December, and that implements the uh, Open Container Initiative specification for runtime and image specs. And then we have SwarmKit, which is the secure orchestration that I told you about. On top of that, we have application services like uh, Compose, uh, Build, and things like that. So as Docker became very successful over the past uh, four years, going from 1 million pools on Docker Hub to 12 billion, we extracted different, all these different components. Uh, so it's not something new that Docker is doing. And so one component we extracted and we announced at DockerCon and we open sourced it on stage uh, is Linux Kit. So we created Linux Kit because our customers asked us, uh, I want Docker for X, where X was a platform uh, that didn't have Linux. Uh, so for example, it's Windows 10 or Mac OS X uh, or Windows Server or Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform and Amazon Web Services, which have lots of different Linux options. Uh, but you don't know if there's one uh, by default. So we needed uh, a Linux subsystem for that. Uh, and that Linux subsystem, we had three characteristics for it. We wanted it to be secure, lean, and portable. And when we uh, talked around us to different partners, we realized the whole industry needed something like that. So people at IBM, Microsoft, ARM, Intel, and HP were super interested in that. And so we launched that project in conjunction with them, uh, and we're going to uh, uh, donate it to the Linux Foundation. So secure. Uh, Linux Kit creates Linux subsystems that are based on containers. So what that means is that they are, uh, all the system services are running in containers. So you, you pick a kernel uh, as a Docker image, and then you have containerd as the init system, and then you have all your system services that are running in containers. So that adds a level of isolation. It's also an incubator for security innovations like WireGuard, Landlock, and KSPP. So we're going to collaborate. Uh, with the whole industry, and we think it's a community-first security process is needed for Linux. Linux is too big for any one company to secure it. So we're going to participate in lots of existing Linux security efforts. It's lean, uh, which means uh, minimal size uh, is around 35 megabytes uh, for an image. Uh, it has minimal boot time. Typically, the images that we're having in our editions are around 100 megs. All system services are containers, and you can remove and add things. And then it's portable. Uh, it needs to run on desktop servers, IoT mainframe, Intel and ARM, bare metal, and virtualized. And at DockerCon, we showed a sample use case uh, that we found really cool uh, for Linux Kit, which is Microsoft decided to add Linux to Windows. Uh, Linux containers support natively into Windows through Hyper-V. And they did that with Docker and Linux Kit. So uh, John Gossman from Microsoft gave a demo of running a container uh, using Docker and Linux Kit on Windows. So you can get the code at Linux Kit, Linux Kit. And then let's talk about Mobi. So as the Docker ecosystem evolved from pioneers at the beginning in 2013-14, our production model was we had a monolithic code base where we were all collaborating on. Then 2015-16, uh, uh, Docker adoption grew a lot. Uh, and there, uh, uh, it grew a lot, especially for a specific use case, which is cloud-native applications on Linux servers. 
And for that, we started componentizing. That's the diagram I showed you before. We started creating all these kits. And our teams were collaborating with the rest of the community on different kits. And then we were assembling them in the product. But right now, what we're seeing since this year, uh, 2017, and that we can see developing over the next year, is that containers are getting mainstream. They use for every category of computing, the server, the data center, the cloud, but also IoT, desktop, and mobile. Uh, and for that, um, we're uh, all, all of these different uh, people are, are building very specialized use cases. Uh, and so they're, uh, they're building for desktop, for servers, for cloud. Uh, uh, they're, they're building for very specialized use cases. And, um, uh, and, and at Docker, we, had, we went through that experience with, uh, uh, with uh, building the different editions for desktop, server, and cloud. And in order to do that, we, show, we saw that the open component model had its limits, where all our teams needed uh, something intermediary between the components and the finalized products to create these additions with small teams that are still productive. And we got inspired by the auto industry, where they have this problem, and they build these common assemblies that they're using to create lots of different cars. And so we did that with our additions. We created that notion of assembly and tools around that. Uh, to create all our additions. And what we thought is that to help the ecosystem grow to the next level, we're going to open source all our components and our tooling so that the whole ecosystem can build their different assemblies and different products, and, but collaborate on these assemblies. We call that the Mobi project. It's the most important project that Docker has created since the original Docker project. It has a library of 80 components. You can package them. Uh, you can package your own components as containers and bring a, uh, bring them in there. It has a reference assemblies that correspond to what we're building at Docker, which is the Docker platform. But you can create your own assemblies uh, or start from existing ones. Uh, so Docker is going to use Mobi for its open source. So if you go to Mobi Mobi, you'll find the whole Docker code base. Uh, but you can create your own assemblies and use these tools uh, to experiment with different type of systems. It's a community-run project. The open governance will be inspired by the Fedora project. And it plays well with existing projects. You don't need to donate your project to it. Uh, you just need to uh, containerize it. And then you can, it can play in there. So the way it looks like is um, you have all these components on the left. And then you have the Mobi project where all these components are assembled into different assemblies. Uh, and then people can build their own products. And at Docker, we're going to build Docker CE and Docker E uh, based on that. So what it means for you, for Docker users, um, uh, they will be able to better leverage the ecosystem to innovate faster for you. For systems builder, Mobi will help you innovate without tying you to Docker. So Mobi transforms what was multi-month R&D project into weekend projects. These are a few examples. So here is a pure uh, Docker components one where we're doing remote attestation for a Linux distribution uh, running in cloud with InfraKit, LinuxKit, and ContainerD. Uh, this is a custom CI CD where we bring some other projects like InfluxDB, Java, Jenkins, and Grafana. Uh, here, you can switch Linux Kit and InfraKit by Terraform and Debian if you want. Uh, this is an example of an OS just to run Redis. And you can uh, create some specialized image uh, for Mac, for Windows, or for bare metal. Uh, another example is ETD clustering on Google Cloud. And this is another example with Kubernetes running on your Mac. So you can get started. Go to mobi.org, uh, mobiproject.org. Uh, we have a blog there with a weekly uh, project reports. Uh, that's from last Friday. Uh, we have a Twitter handle, and you can go to GitHub, uh, Mobi slash Mobi. All right, so that's the Mobi project, and that's uh, kind of uh, all the, the main announcements uh, that we made on the open source and product side uh, uh, for Docker at DockerCon. Um, so we do have a, a first question. Uh, so the first one we have from Anthony is, um, and I noticed this on your slides, you have gRPC in there. So um, how does it fit into the Linux kit project? And I guess since the Mobi project as well would be my question. Yeah, so um, uh, in Linux kit, so all the tools that we are developing right now, uh, or I'd say all the tools, like Docker has a, a JSON API 
uh, REST JSON API, uh, and that's the traditional Docker API. But once you get into the inside components that Docker is using, uh, most of them are exposing a gRPC API. So that's the case of Container D, for example, uh, which is exposing a gRPC API. Uh, for Mobi and Linux Kit, I don't know. Uh, you should take a look at the inside of the Linux Kit repo uh, to see what kind of API they're exposing. I wouldn't be surprised if they expose a gRPC API in there. Yeah, in fact, I was wondering if Luke might know a little bit more, because Luke will also be talking a little bit on his um, participation in the Linux Kit project. So Luke, do you know? Yeah, sure. I mean, I just, uh, I, it's worth maybe adding a little bit of context uh, to that as well, which is just to mention that um, in, in case it wasn't clear, like not all of the projects in the Mobi, not all of the, the projects listed are actually part of the Mobi project. The, the Mobi project oh. is about being able to, to have a library of, of external things that can be containerized and pulled in. Um, so that's another way of sort of thinking about that, that question and, and the answer. Oh, yeah. And another thing I wanted to rebound on what Luke is saying, uh, the, the goal of the Mobi project is to have as little uh, as little components inside of the project. Uh, like if you're looking at container D, for example, we donated it to CNCF. Uh, and so the goal of the Mobi project is to have a curated list of um, uh, containers and components that are developed uh, in other upstream projects uh, who have their own repositories, maybe are, are managed in different foundations. Uh, but that work well for building containerized system. And so a lot of these components, as, uh, as Luke is saying, uh, are not coming from Docker. They're coming from uh, different open source projects. Cool. I was actually curious about the uh, common assembly model that you mentioned. You said you took it from the auto industry. So is that, I'm a little bit ignorant, but is that something that's just really new and unique, or is that also practiced in, practiced in other um, like software development or software development uh, companies? Uh, I've not, personally, I've not seen that done uh, in other projects. Uh, I think it's really, it's really something we had to, to create in order to create all our different editions for the different uh, cloud providers and to have that layer, that intermediary layer between the components and the final product where you could have some common parts and that then could be specialized for each of the different platforms. Uh, so I don't know, Luke, do you have, uh, have you seen that in other projects before? I haven't personally seen it elsewhere. Um, yeah, I think it, it seems uh, fairly novel. Yeah, it seems pretty innovative and interesting. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, um, I did have one last one. I, I assume some of this had um, sort of internal customers or developers playing with it. Have you gotten any feedback on these new announcements as you were leading up to DockerCon? Or is this sort of the start and then you're going to see who, who jumps on and see um, how to grow and change and shift with feedback? Yeah, so actually we had uh, lots of feedback from the Linux Kit launch partners. Uh, so Intel, ARM, um, uh, Microsoft, and IBM. Uh, and since then, what, what was great, because uh, we've been planning to release all that for, for a while now, and we're really glad that it's out. Because as soon as we announced it at DockerCon, uh, we started having lots of meetings from like companies that, that are not in that industry at all, uh, but like, like really large companies who are interested in building vertical specialized container systems uh, that were super interested in Mobi and Linux Kit. Uh, and so I cannot name names yet, but what I can tell you that I had personally conversations with like a, a mobile, um, a mobile carrier provider who's interested in that for um, for their own infrastructure for cell towers uh, to build like a specialized uh, Linux kit based distribution using Mobi to build all that and infra kit to deploy it uh, for their cell infrastructure uh, their cell tower infrastructures. 
uh, and their network function virtualization infrastructure. The other one that I had conversations with uh, is a company that's doing uh, Internet of Things or industrial internet type of uh, applications where like the lean, secure, portable, uh, specialized Linux um, subcomponent that you can build with Linux, that was of a lot of interest to them. So yeah, definitely the fact of having open sourced it uh, will just open it up to a lot of uh, players who may not be interested in a traditional orchestration platform or products that exist today that target more the either cloud or on-prem uh, uh, deployments of container-based workloads. Uh, but they're more interested in building, uh, building a specialized system, and that's exactly what it was designed for. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing some more of those. Um, so, so we'll have a Linux, uh, we'll have a Mobi Summit sometimes in June, uh, and we'll also have some Mobi events at the uh, Open Source Summit uh, organized by the Linux Foundation in LA in September. So we have these two dates where we'll probably start to have more public references for this project that were just announced uh, three weeks ago. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know. Um, so people probably know Patrick is extremely busy. You actually just ran from a talk at OSCON to come do this. So we really, really appreciate your time. And you're a very busy person. It's a, it's a pleasure to. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, always a pleasure. Yeah. Um, one more question in the chat. Yeah. Oh, well, one last thing I wanted to do before answering the last question is uh, I wanted to do a big shout out to Weave. Uh, so so the, the, the Weave team uh, have been involved in, uh, so they were early, they had early access to all these projects, Linux, Kit, and Mobi. Uh, and so one of the, the most complex demo that was shown on stage at DockerCon, uh, the one with uh, Kubernetes running on a Mac, uh, was actually made by Elia from Weave. Uh, and then uh, all the clarification about the project and the project versus the product, uh, uh, Luke actually led that effort in the Mobi community. So Luke is a, is a, a kind of one of the leaders of the Mobi community already. So really, thank you, Weave, for, for being a, a great citizen in that new community. Does Luke get a, a jacket for a badge? Did you get your t-shirt? Oh, you get a t-shirt. Yeah, I got a t-shirt. <laughs> I love my t-shirt. I think I got two, actually. So. Awesome. You, you no, more than deserve that. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Luke, did yeah. you say you saw something? I, I'm actually not seeing. Oh, I just saw a question from Mike Taylor saying, uh, Kubernetes, could you speak a little to it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so wh when you look at that stack uh, that, that, that was in the slides, uh, you have the generic stack where you say infrastructure, uh, um, OS, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then you have orchestration. So there, in terms of orchestration, we're just listening to our customers. We built our super secure orchestration with SwarmKit. And our customers really uh, seem to like that as part of the Docker project uh, product. But um, uh, some customers may want to use uh, our, our parts of our product uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, and by componentizing uh, the different parts of the stack and specifying the relationship between them, uh, it makes it easier, easier for customers to use, uh, uh, for example, Kubernetes on top of uh, Docker EE. Uh, and another aspect that I wanted to point out is uh, there's a lot of effort in the Kubernetes community right now to uh, make Kubernetes secure. So I was at KubeCon, uh, I think, two months ago, and uh, some guy from Red Hat gave a very interesting presentation explaining the, the security roadmap of Kubernetes, which uh, very closely corresponds to the, to the SwarmKit, uh, to the security that exists in SwarmKit today. Uh, so I think there are lots of components from SwarmKit that could be reused in the Kubernetes uh, uh, in the Kubernetes code base to make it more secure. So by creating that Mobi project, we hope that uh, um, people who are building systems out of containers can use either SwarmKit, Kubernetes, or Mesos. As long as things are containerized, it's very easy to mix and match them together.
Well, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for your questions. Uh, with that, Patrick, I'll let you go <laughs> rest or right. go to your next session. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, all right. and, uh, I just listened to Luke. I want to oh, see what you oh, okay. Well then, yes. <laughs> go ahead and um, you can turn off your I video. Just stop my video and uh, okay. mute myself. Cool. And Luke, uh, you can take it away. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to to come and join our little user group. Um, and and uh, thanks for the really, really great update. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit today about uh, Prometheus, so sort of changing gears a little bit, although I guess it relates to, um, to, to Patrick's talk in the context of, um, uh, of production operations. So when you really have um, containers in production, then one of the things that's really, really important to be able to do is to be able to monitor them and to generate alerts based on if your monitoring metrics um, show you that there's something wrong. Um, and Prometheus is uh, a project um, that, that came out of a company called, uh, called SoundCloud, and, um, uh, and it's becoming very quickly the sort of standard way of, of doing monitoring um, uh, with containerized environments. So I've got sort of two very short uh, quickfire talks that I'm going to do back to back and then a demo at the end. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and um, share my screen. OK, cool. So I'm going to very, very quickly go over an introduction to Prometheus to begin with. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about Prometheus and Swarm and how we worked with uh, Justin Cormack here in, uh, in the UK, uh, who works at Docker, um, on getting those two things working together. Um, but just before I do that, just a very quick word about what we do at Weaveworks and why we care about Prometheus. Um, so at Weaveworks, we are building a product called Weave Cloud, which we operate as a service, uh, which is all about getting you as a development team around this loop faster. And what the, I'll show you what the loop is uh, sort of using, using these, uh, these graphics. So what you have here is you have a, a development team uh, building a software product, and you have users who are consuming that software product. And the first thing you need to do when you're a development team is to be able to ship features as quickly as possible. And so a feature might be this green star. That might be an idea um, that developers turn into code. Developers then push that code into a CI system which builds Docker images. And uh, that CI system um, uh, then outputs those Docker images into a container registry, like a Docker registry. So the first thing that Weave Cloud does is that it helps you take the output of your CI system uh, and plug it into um, your production container orchestration framework, um, which could well be Docker Swarm. Um, and we then recommend that users are running uh, Prometheus, which is the diagram here with the, with the fire um, in, the in the red circle. Um, and what Prometheus can help you do is to notice when there's a problem, alert you to the fact that there's a problem, and then help you get this problem, which is this red star, uh, back around the loop as quickly as possible uh, and turned into a fix. So we have a couple of tools um, so, uh, about explore and monitor. Um, and one of those, the monitoring tool is built on Prometheus. And that's all about being able to get this red star into the, in, into the hands of the developers so the developers can understand the problem. And they can turn it into a green star. So they, they can turn a problem into a code change. And then they can ship that code change back around the loop as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, the argument that we're making is that as a software team, your competitiveness is a direct function of how fast you can go around this loop. And in order to be able to go around the loop quickly, a key part of that is uh, being able to monitor your application while it's in production. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through some high-level Prometheus concepts. Um, and then uh, I'm going to uh, then talk about the integration that we did. Um, so uh, Prometheus as a project uh, came out of a company called SoundCloud. Uh, it was created by a couple of ex-Google engineers. And uh, Google and, and those, Google, those, those couple of Google engineers, um, they'd already invented a container orchestration framework. This was years before, uh, before Docker even became uh, called Docker, um, and uh, and they they'd already built this orchestration framework based on their experience of this thing called Borg, which is how Google run their containers at scale, and then they were also inspired by this thing called Borgmon um, to build a project called Prometheus, uh, and um, so it shares many of the same traits as you'll see. So just very quick primer on Prometheus. Prometheus is a time series database. 
Uh, that means that it stores a list of timestamp value pairs um, and the values that it stores are just floating point numbers. Um, using those floating point numbers, you can represent a, ver a variety of things like counters and gauges. Uh, counters are things that always go up, um, like uh, the number of requests to a, to a web server, for example, until they get reset back to zero. Whereas gauges are a bit different. Uh, gauges um, are like a thermometer in a room. So it might go up from 10 degrees to 20 degrees and then back to 10 degrees. Um, and if you, were, if you weren't sampling it fast enough, then you might sort of lose resolution. Um, so anyway, the, the idea here is that there's this, this idea of a time series. The, the other important fact about Prometheus is that the things that index the time series are uh, sets of key value pairs. So you have key one maps onto A and key two maps onto B, for example. Um, there's a special piece of magic, which is just that you can, if you see something that looks like this in PromQL, which is the Prometheus query language, like this word requests here, then that actually expands internally to this sort of magic label called double underscore name double underscore equals requests. Um, and uh, that allows you to really understand this, um, uh, this data model in terms, of, uh, in terms of the PromQL expressions that we're going to see in a second. So again, very quickly, I'm going to take you through uh, a concrete example. So we might have this concrete example of a web server which is counting the, the number of requests to the web server. In this case, it might go 1, 2, 3, 13, 23, 33, etc. Um, and this could be like, for the first three seconds, we only get one request per second. For the next three seconds, we get 10 requests per second. And then we go back to only getting one request a second. And so the data looks like this, and the graph looks like this. But just from looking at this graph, like just the requests data, um, it's not very useful uh, to sort of squint at this graph and try and understand the rate of change of these numbers. So what we need to do from a mathematical perspective is is just differentiate this graph effectively. And so I'll show you how PromQL uh, and how Prometheus allows you to do this. So this is just the graph that you get when you type in the PromQL expression requests. Um, and by the way, what's going on here is that actually inside Prom Prometheus, there's uh, a key value pair name equals requests that's mapping onto these timestamps and the values um, at those times. Uh, which I'm representing here in this in this table because it's a little bit easier to understand, um, a little bit easier to see there. Um, the next thing we need to understand is that you can add this square bracket syntax um, to uh, to any value in PromQL, and basically it turns it from a uh, scalar value into a vector. And that sounds fancy, but all it means is that we take, for example, um, requests over three seconds. We'll take one, two, and three, and put them vertically, one, two, and three, and then it will chunk this thing along by one, and put those values in the second column, and so on and so forth. And so in this way, you end up with this, um, this, this vector um, value, which is really like a table um, uh, showing these, um, uh, these values over these intervals. And then now we can finally get to this function rate, uh, which finds the per second rate of change over one of these vector queries, i.e. one of those tables that we just saw. And so this means that for, um, uh, for each vector, we can take the last value minus the first value and divide that by the last time minus the first time, um, because that gives you the per second rate of change. And I'll, I'll show you an example again. So we're taking the, first, the last value minus the first value, and, which is 2, and we're dividing it by the uh, time difference, which is also 2, so the first value is 1. And I won't read out all the numbers because it's just very simple arithmetic. But what you can see here as we go through and we do this calculation is that we've then turned this uh, sort of monotonically increasing value here um, into a table. And then we've turned that table back into uh, this rate of change value here. And so this uh, rate, um, uh, rate of the counter over three seconds, for example, is something that you'll see very, very often um, in PromQL, and you'll see uh, in the example in a minute. Um, so I'm going to skip through uh, the rest of that just because of time. Um, but I'm going to very briefly mention uh, Docker Swarm here, um, which is to say that Docker Swarm is a container orchestrator which lets you cluster a set of Docker hosts. It allows you to deploy things called services, which are multiple replicas of a container across many hosts. And it also provides networking and service discovery in the cluster. And so this is really what you need if you're deploying an application that needs to run on more than one machine, so any non-trivial application, really. 
Um, Weave Cloud, uh, which is the product that I mentioned at the beginning, contains a scalable multi-tenant version of Prometheus. And so we would love it if it was possible for you to take metrics that you gather from your Docker Swarm cluster and push them up to Weave Cloud uh, using Prometheus. And so we got Prometheus working with Docker Swarm. Um, my goal was to make Weave Cloud accessible to Docker Swarm users. Uh, and Justin Cormack's goal was just that everyone kept bugging him about how, how, to, how to do Prometheus. And so we started looking at how to integrate these things together. Um, the first thing that we did uh, was that I took the train up from London uh, to Cambridge in England. Um, and, uh, and, and we went for a walk around the botanical gardens in, in Cambridge. Um, and uh, as we were walking down, uh, down the path in the botanical gardens, um, Justin pointed out the, the first problem that we were going to have to solve. And the, the main problem, the, the first problem that we had to solve is that, as, uh, as Patrick mentioned earlier, you can have multiple networks in a Docker Swarm cluster. So you can have a, one service uh, here, uh, in so called service A in network A and a different service B in network B. And if you have Prometheus, what the, the, the way that Prometheus is supposed to work is that you have one Prometheus instance for your cluster. And so that Prometheus instance needs to be able to talk to all of these different services. So we decided to build this, uh, I, this thing called the Prometheus wrapper that talks to the Swarm API to find out what things there are in the cluster, writes out service configuration, service discovery information to um, uh, the Prometheus config, and then starts Prometheus on the right Docker networks. The problem, though, is that in a busy cluster, you might have new services and new networks coming and going constantly, all the time, as people deploy new versions of new services, um, and so on. And the problem is that you can't, or at least we thought that you couldn't, uh, dynamically attach um, the Prometheus container to different networks. So we would have to shut down the Prometheus container every time something new showed up and then start it up again on the right networks. And we decided that that wasn't good enough because it meant that Prometheus could miss uh, some scrapes. So we then came up with a more complicated architecture, which was to put this proxy in every single network. And that way, when a new service and a network shows up, we can just deploy the new proxy. And then we thought about how that proxy could be implemented. And we realized that we started going down this path of writing a custom proxy. And that custom proxy started looking a lot like Prometheus itself. And then we realized, oh, we can use Prometheus in federated mode because it has support for that, sort of like a tree structure of different Promethei, or whatever the plural of Prometheus is. And so I took this design back to, back to London, and I showed it to my colleague, Tom. And he said, that, you're not going to do that, are you? Um, he sort of ruined our, our fun by saying that, that, that as a design, that just sounded far too complicated. So the next part of the story uh, happened in Amsterdam. I flew down to Amsterdam to uh, visit the container solutions team who we work closely with. Um, and they had some spare cycles to work on this problem, so they picked it up. And the first thing that Alexandru, who's uh, one of the very smart engineers at the container solutions team, noticed was that actually containers now could be dynamically added to networks. That was a feature that was added uh, very recently in, in Docker Swarm. And so now we realize we can go back to the simple architecture, write the service discovery, and then when a new service shows up, just dynamically reattach um, Prometheus, the Prometheus container to a new network and rewrite its config. And Prometheus also supports hot reloading its config. So now we never needed to restart that Prometheus container. And so that's what we did. Uh, we built um, a... Um, uh, a, a prototype of this. And uh, using this prototype, you can now monitor your application in Docker Swarm uh, and then plug that into Weave Cloud, uh, which, of course, was my original goal. Um, so um, I will uh, just very quickly show you a demo. Um, let me see. Hopefully, everyone can see this. I cheated. This is a video, so I apologize. Um, but here we have a, uh, a Docker Swarm cluster. Um, we're just using uh, the explore feature of Weave Cloud to get a shell uh, on, on the master, but we can see it's a swarm cluster because we can type docker swarm ls. Um, we can then uh, notice that there's the Prometheus swarm discovery um, container running on here, and uh, that's this project, which I linked to uh, just now um, on GitHub that we worked on. And so we deployed that Prometheus uh, just by running, and the discovery service just by running docker swarm uh, deploy. 
And then if we scroll down here, we should also be able to see uh, that there is a Prometheus container running um, also in this cluster. And that Prometheus container um, is, uh, is, is scraping all of the processes that are running um, uh, in that cluster. So we also have a sock shop, um, which is our sample app that we use for a lot of our demos. Um, and if you reload the page on the sock shop, it feels like there's something a little bit wrong with this application. Um, it feels like every time you load the page, the home page, it, it takes quite a long time to load. And as everyone knows, um, that's going to be a real problem in, uh, in an e-commerce environment because latency will kill your sock sales. So we can go in and try and use the uh, Prometheus uh, feature inside Weave Cloud um, to figure out what the problem is. And immediately we can see by doing this query, which shows the average request latency across all of the services in the cluster, um, that there's an outlier, which is the um, catalog service. So every time there's a request to the catalog service, it seems to take exactly two seconds. Now, if we go back into uh, Weave Cloud, I'll let you into a secret. There's a slow version and a fast version of the catalog service. So I'm just going to use the Weave Cloud here to um, release uh, the fast version of the catalog service. Uh, we can then go back to, um, oh, by the way, I can show you that that version controls a change to a Docker Compose file. Uh, that's part of our deploy feature um, inside Weave Cloud. And then if we go back um, to the home page and we reload the page, we can now see that that fast version is indeed working and, it, and that's made the home page a lot quicker. So um, let's just put a bit more data in there. And then if we go back to, um, back to the Prometheus feature in Weave Cloud and we rerun that query, we should be able to see that the very recent data, if we zoom all the way in here, uh, the very recent data um, is much, much faster. And so we can see the catalog is indeed uh, responding in 0 0.002 seconds, um, for example, uh, to those requests. Um, there's one more thing I'm going to show you uh, very, very quickly, which is that if we look inside um, the Explore tab of Weave Cloud here, uh, we can zoom in and filter just by the Prometheus components. And we can go in and look that there's the Prometheus Swarm uh, discovery, and there's also the Prometheus instance itself, which is running there. And if we go in and look at the Docker networks, then we can see this nice, uh, colorful view um, on the Prometheus container showing that the uh, Swarm discovery um, component has dynamically attached that Prometheus container to all of the networks, uh, which is exactly what I said it would do. Um, and so we can just sort of verify visually uh, that that has worked. Um, and that's it. I've got one minute left. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, please shout on the chat. Um, if not, and if you haven't already, please join the Weave user group. Uh, we have many more talks and trainings on things like continuous delivery, network policy, and we do a deeper dive on Prometheus monitoring. Um, and so with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And thank you very much. Um, so yeah, any questions, Slack channel for our user group? Um, I think if you get any emails from Weave, it has my name on it and my email address, so you can also email me directly. So thanks again for your time. Thanks for joining us. Um, look at our calendar. We have many more wonderful guest speakers like Patrick uh, in our future groups. So um, again, Patrick is still here. So thanks, Patrick, and thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>